Okay, hello and welcome to episode 75 of the Market Maker podcast and a little bit different than our usual routine because Piers Curran is on holiday again and Piers, I know you're listening, so enjoy yourself, but come on, you've got to do some work at some point. But uh, instead, in his place, we're going to change things up a little bit and I'm joined by Milan Deep Bassi. And oh, how Mil- are you doing? Hey, Milan. And Milan is part of our technology team. And what we're going to do is I'm going to quickly wrap up all of the things that have happened in markets as quick as I can, because I'm just conscious of there's a lot that has been happening and I don't want anyone to go without. And then we're going to bring Milan into the conversation and we're going to talk a little bit about his background and his expertise, where he helps design and deliver some of our most advanced quant related training to the likes of Citadel, for example. And so really want to pick his brains and get into that subject matter because I know it's a real growth area for a lot of students and and future applications. So first off, what's been happening in markets this week? So mega cap tech earnings have really dominated. um, And actually, I guess summary, they weren't as bad as feared. Can't be said for all of them. Meta, Facebook continuing to fall on rough times. But let me just go through a few of them. So Amazon, last night, we're we're recording this on Friday 29th. So on Thursday night, their shares went up 12% post-market. We are talking about one of the biggest companies on planet Earth going up 12%. So that's that's a huge move. Strong sales and a strong outlook lifted their shares. Apple were also up 4% last night, beating on revenue and profit. Earlier in the week, we had Microsoft. They actually turned in their slowest revenue growth since 2020 at just 12% year over year uh, growth in the quarter, which is quite insane. On the conference call, more importantly, so although their revenue growth slowed on their outlook, they said they expect revenue operating income to increase the double digit pace for fiscal 2023 and the shares rocketed after that. Alphabet missed on most numbers. I think when you were watching those coming out earlier in the week, you were thinking, oh, doesn't look too good. But their advertising revenues came in at 56.29 billion. And that was above expectations. There was a lot of anxiety in the market about these online advertising stocks because of the precedent that had been set by Snap and Twitter, who had disastrous figures because of marketing budgets generally just being slashed with the looming recession. But Google's stranglehold on that digital spend being, well, is ultimately, I guess, a necessity for businesses is keeping that ticking over nicely. But Meta, as I said, reported their first year-over-year revenue decline in Q2, and it's going to get worse. And so they expect a range of 26 to 28.5 billion US dollars in Q3 revenue and that was against a street estimate of over 30 billion. So they've downgraded their future outlook. They cited continuation of weak advertising demand environment we experienced through the second quarter, which they believe is being driven by broader macroeconomic uncertainty. I think I read on their, their press statement and then listening to a conference call, I think I heard the word TikTok more than I heard the word Facebook. So that kind of is a summation of their fears, I guess, at the moment. Um, Bringing earnings a little bit closer to home, Shell, the oil major, there to accelerate their share buyback program. They reported record profits for the second consecutive quarter, obviously benefiting from surging oil and gas prices. France's Total Energies, which is their other, I guess, competing um, big company within that space, reported this week their second quarter profits that had almost tripled So whilst the majority are suffering at this point, these energy stocks have have really benefited from that energy squeeze. On the macro side, the European gas crisis is going from bad to worse. That is influencing then uh, and really destabilizing consumer confidence in the Eurozone, which is now at a 17-month low. The key factor there is flow on the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, that critical pipeline servicing then gas flows coming out of Russia, particularly to Germany, that's now been cut to just a fifth of normal capacity. And there's a lot of pointing fingers between whose blame uh, uh, that lies on in that sense. So other things 
Q2 advanced GDP in the US at fell 0.9% on an annualized rate. And that came after 1.6% decline in the first three months of the year, meaning two back-to-back periods of contraction now for the US. So all the different terminology aside, this is a technical recession. And so a lot of pressure now for what are the Fed going to do next? And we had the Fed decision. They delivered back-to-back 75 basis point rate hikes, but they surprised with a dovish hint that the Fed could slow the pace of rate hikes. And actually, if you were looking at your your US equity charts, I think we're up at over 7% in the NASDAQ 100 in the last 48 hours or so. So kind of um, the worst case averted for any fears that might have been present for these big mega cap tech earnings in combination with the looming slowdown with the commentary from the Fed in the US has meant that then rate hikes have been pared back. And in fact, European stocks are now looking at their best monthly gains since November 2020. And the NASDAQ 100 has just hit a seven week high. Um, talking of risk, appetite, if stocks are rallying, so is crypto. So Millen, you'll be happy. Bitcoin, Ether heading towards their best month since 2021. Ether's up about 72% on the month alone. So seeing a bit of movement there as well. But undoubtedly, the biggest news of the week, of course, was McDonald's raising the price of their cheeseburger. Did you see that, Mill? Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Um, How do you feel about that? Well, I'm I'm at the point where I've noticed, near me anyways, I have three McDonald's on on the same road. Um, If I go to each one, they have different prices. Now there's one in the middle, which is the most expensive. (laughs) And that's now going to be like over five pounds for for a meal. And I don't want to go there. Okay, look, we've got an arbitrage opportunity here. I reckon we should buy some at the cheap place. We'll park out the expensive ones, sell them on discount. So look, we've got a business idea there. But yeah, the cheeseburger in the UK has gone up 20%. And and it's the first time in 14 years. So yeah, the cost of living crisis is real, folks. Um, But look, let's delve into a conversation then with with Mill. I'm really happy that he's taken out some time to, to talk to me. And really, it came about because at the moment, we've got our summer analyst training program happening. Uh, Millen runs some really cool um, simulation sessions with them that particularly are around Python and programming and quant trading. And I jumped in and it's the complete other side of the area of markets I work in. And I was in the office the other day looking at Millen's screen and it made me feel, it made me feel sick, if I'm quite honest, because it was just full of code. Um, but Milan, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, your role at Amplify, and then we can go into uh, perhaps a bit more of a conversation about um, the kind of tips and tricks about the quant space. Yeah, of course. I think um, so I found Amplify, I think, back in 2018 now. Uh, my, my dad showed me and he was like, you should be a trader. Traders, you know, they have nice cars. They, they, they live the lifestyle, you know. Uh, the, the stuff that used to kind of get sold around back there. So I was like, okay, you know what? This sounds good. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to check these guys out. Maybe I'll have a, a Ferrari or a Lambo or something by, uh, by like 25. Right. I, I was hooked on the dream at 18. Um, and I, I was studying computer science at the time, um, at Royal Holloway. Um, and I was like, I remember telling people, I was like, I'm going to shift, you know, I don't want to work in, in these fan companies. I want to, I want to be a trader. Um, that didn't go very well, but, uh, the point was, I guess, is you know, my dad got me hooked on finance. Uh, and then from there, obviously, uh, him did the program with you guys for three weeks. And, uh, back then it was in person and oh, that was, it was an unreal experience to still, uh, you know, I, I still talk about it with, with people today. Um, and then like things clicked in place and I started out as an intern and I used to do a lot of the, the grunt work, I guess, and no, no programming back in the days I used to little things like fix this Excel sheet, add a, a formula or something here. Um, and then as I did more of my degree, I guess I found out where, where my passions lie with like Java and, and Python and things like that. Uh, and then I've kind of transitioned over across many roles. So I think my, my current title right now is like a, a full stack DevOps engineer, um, which basically means I can do, you know, your, your front end, which is like your HTML, your CSS, you know, making things look pretty. Um, but then I can also do the back end, which is all the logic and you know all, all all the complicated things. And then on top of that, most people's career career is normally confined there. 
I now also do networking and things, so I can set you up servers. I can set up all 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 this other stuff as well with internet, um, and things. And yeah, I I basically do what apparently three jobs, I guess. <laughs> it, 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 but I get the title for it, so so it's worth it. Um, and then, and you deliver, of course. Yeah, yeah. So so that, I guess that's the next thing. My title also says I'm the the fintech product lead right now, which is basically like like Ant said, um, I create quant or or even algorithmic trading products now and then. We, we go to our clients and, and deliver them because I want to help other people program. I think it's a, it's a great skill to have. And, obviously, you know, I think the more people that understand how code works and hopefully they don't get headaches from looking at it, um, it, it just makes everyone li- life easier and kind of good for the future, right? Could, could you have done what you're doing now without studying computer science? I, I don't think so. I think um, it's a very difficult thing because i never touched any code until i was 18 and i think a lot of people have this misconception where if i don't do my Mm. my like programming a level for example that's my my career gone out the window so back in a levels i was primarily into economics that was my 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 strong subject right um and and i only went out kind of went to clearing on that day i decided i'm gonna go from accounting and finance as my degree to computer science just like that on the day because i didn't get the results i wanted for accounting um and obviously i think you know kind of to get to the point where i am at yeah i, th- I think i need my degree uh, and the only reason is because a lot of uh like probability and statistics and kind of the way you problem solve is what gets taught at uni and i think that's the most valuable thing you walk away it's not kind of knowing how to code it's the the way to look at a task and break it down and go from there but it's not something you can't just you can i mean you can learn it online i guess it's just there's no real structure when you learn online. Obviously, with with a degree, you just get that that kind of structure and path. Yeah, that that kind of structure and way of thinking you just mentioned. Is, are we talking maths then? No, so I don't use too much maths, but it's more like if you pose a, a question to me, like a simple thing, like I want this button to do something. I think a lot of people would get fixated on on the wrong thing. They might look at it and say, uh, "I'm." You know, I've I've seen it in the past with some people they they get focused on the end result rather than how they're going to get to the end result. So I think when I say structured thinking, I mean you need to be able to look at the task, say I need to do X, Y, Z, and you just go in this order. Uh, and and the problem with 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 our jobs, I guess, when you're in your engineer, is it needs to happen now. <laughs> I don't have you know a, a week. I can't say to 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 a manager, I'll be back in a week. I'm going to go and see what this button does. You know, I need, I need to look at it and say, you know, off the top of my head, this will take me a few days, maybe, or, or you know, a couple hours. Um, and I think that's that structured thinking, because I need to be able to quickly say, you know, I need A, B, and C completed before I can do, you know, what, whatever whatever I need. And I think that's the, the hardest thing that I find that a lot of people can't get is, if I, you know, when I run the sessions, is a lot of people get stuck on the, how does this go to that and then go to this? And it's just because they feel like there's a lot of magic in between. Um, so it's a bit of a difficult one, I guess. And is there any way in your mind to improve that way of thinking? Like things you can be doing, like even outside of that actual task that are just general using that same memory muscle or brain muscle? Yeah, I think, um, well, that's where the kind of the, you know, like a business analyst kind of role comes in. I think one of the, the lucky things of doing my, my placement year with, with Amplify was, I had a small time where I was a business analyst and my main job was kind of, you know, to talk to someone like yourself and, and say, what do you need done? And then obviously I need to convert what you need done to what, to what the engineers need. Mm. Um, and being that kind of middleman translator almost from, you know, just like a, a one or two sentences to maybe a whole paragraph detailing what needs to be done is what builds that skill. Uh, and, I, and I guess, how do you do that yourself at home? Well, it's like if, if I say to you, um, I want to build an, an algo strategy, the first thing I need to know is where do I get my data? So Googling where do you get the data, reading it up on it, you know, putting that into maybe like a notebook and saying, okay, I can do X, Y, Z. And then from there, you have to pick which one I'm going to use. And it's kind of just building projects from, from the start to the end without kind of cheating. Um, rather than just saying, go to a YouTube video, right? For, I just watched this for four hours. The guy's going to teach me everything I need to know. Um, I used to do that, but it, there's no fun, right? Because you don't have that research phase and you know, looking around and figuring things out yourself. Mm. Okay. 
And then, and then I'm just thinking about then, you mentioned before, just going back to computer science, because I know quite a few people are, uh, are kind of thinking of that as subject to, to potentially study or study further. But I, I heard you say before about you've got a friend who was studying at a different university and he was the difference between having good algorithm skills or good programming skills. What do you mean by that? Like, how is that different? Yeah. So I think this is one of those things where, where when I got to uni, I thought, you know, obviously you get taught the same thing everywhere, but with slight differences. But what I found with, with my friend, he went to, to Loughborough um, and the way they taught his degree and, and the way he's kind of come out at the end of the, the three years is if you had a question about algorithms or any more of a, a mathematical kind of problem, I would say you can ask me, but it might take me a bit longer than, than him. Likewise, when it comes to, to programming, basically, you ask me, I'll, I'll get the code written and, and working quicker than he does. And the reason being is I think he had more mathematical modules. So he learned more about like the theory and the, the, the key understandings behind computer science, like what makes things tick and, um, you know, so for example, execution time, you know, there's a whole maths and a bunch of formulas behind how fast should something be and how do you calculate that? um and things like that but i had i think maybe two terms of kind of lessons on that um whereas he might have had maybe i i know like for in my final year i didn't touch a single bit of maths um my primary kind of modules offered to me were around information security so i have a lot of knowledge in terms of being very like safe on the internet you know like hacking and things like that whereas he was offered more uh, like i said algorithmic stuff so his knowledge on, on that on that stuff varies and i think that's the one of those things where when you're 18 and you pick a uni you don't know what what style they're going to teach um and it just happened to be raw holloway taught a lot more programming so i think when it comes to he's come to me in the past actually when it comes to writing code he'll come to me and pose a question being like can i do this in python can i do this in java even though on paper we're the same person in terms of our degree and, and what we achieved um I'm better at that, unfortunately, and he's better at the, the, the algo side of things. And that's the tricky part is when you're kind of looking for, for talent, I guess, is you've got a bachelor's in computer science, you've got one, hmm. who's the better programmer, but then, okay, I might be the better programmer, but then I could be absolutely rubbish at my algos, which is not going to do well at like a place like Citadel, right? So what, what, um, what's the most common then? Is it that most people are specialized in an area like that rather than a generalist? I mean, do you, in, a, in a typical like Citadel team, then you have multiple different specialists covering them. What would those areas be? Yeah. So, so Citadel, just from a, a top level breakdown, I guess they kind of split people into investment and trading. These are, they still have computer science degrees, but these will might be people who are on kind of the front desk, any trading job, right? Um, and they'll be good at risk management and actually reacting to markets at the same time. Uh, and then another role is, is your quantitative research. So a quant research is, is pretty straightforward. It's going to be someone who creates these algos and researches them and, and finds all of the maybe, you know, discrepancies in the market through statistical analysis and models, right? Um, so this might be someone who's really good at maths. But they'll, like I said, they'll still have the same background. They know how to program. They did computer science. Uh, and then you'll have software engineers. And then software engineers are those who can program and kind of create the systems for the other two to use perhaps. Mm. Um, and then you can see like everyone would have the same background almost, but they've split them into kind of these three groups of people. So you've got your, 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 your he maths heavy. So I would tell my friend, for example, if he got the, if he understood finance a bit more, you go for a QR role because right. you'd, you'd excel there. Myself personally, I'd probably be split between software engineering and investment and trading. I'd have to kind of try both out, but, um, you know, other people uh, uh, who kind of pro program more than anything, I'd say go do a software engineering one, right? Mm. Because investment and trading is a very, I guess that's the hard one to find because you need someone who can program, manage the risk and understand the finance and, and react to things like you would as a trader because you're basically managing live, live code. Yeah. No, I remember being pulled in because there was a market event that had happened and they wanted me to come in and give a quick sound bite. I think when one of you guys were training with them, and uh, I remember I was talking to one girl and she was previously interning at NASA. 
<laughs> and I was just like, yes, some of these okay, CVs are ridiculous. my mind. My mind's blown now. <laughs> I used to work as a 16 year old in McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, I worked at Toby Carvery. So you know, hum humble beginnings, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but but talking of these people, then when we're talking about <clears throat> these kind of elite level financial institutions, from your experience, then, because I know that's not the only one that you've you've dealt with. What's been your your experience, like your interactions with these people? Because I think there is a degree of mystique around, particularly the quant side of the the industry. Yeah, I think um, like obviously from my my cohort at uni, I can't think of these people that would work at these companies because they're, they're they're kind of more. I don't know how to describe it. I couldn't pick someone from my whole cohort and say, you know, he has the skills for, for Citadel. And like you said, because there is a, I don't know where they find these people. <laughs> uh the, the 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 like the the talent and, and the way they you know they come across is very much like you know you, you I, I was speaking with peers once i was like you, you look at them and you think they're just the, your your average geek and kind of um you know you'd expect them to work in like a fang or whatever right do it do it kind of a a more comp sci uh, stereotypical job uh, and then you speak to them and you realize these guys have immense knowledge about finance already at, at, at this such such a young age mm. um and I think that's obviously that's why it's such a lucrative role, almost, right? You're 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 looking for a needle in a haystack that can kind of do something that's not. I mean, I I can't. I was looking at masters, for example. It's very hard to find a degree where they'll teach you comp sci and apply that to a, to a finance background. So it, it, computational finance, for example, there was only a. a I mean, it's, it's taught widely, but there's only a few places where it's actually taught well. Um, and I think that's the, the tricky part, right? Like I can go do a master's in comp sci, but it doesn't mean I'm going to get this job at, at Citadel because I need that specific kind of mm. angle, I guess. And, and then that's very hard to find. And I think the way you'll find someone like that is someone who, like myself, I guess, is someone who's been interested in finance for a long time and kind of, you know, in their free time, you know, watches the news and keeps yeah. an eye on things like markets, like, you know, we've got what 10 15 engineers now at, at the firm and i'd say only myself and one other actively keep up with markets just because we ha we have a shared interest i guess in, in that and the rest are just you know they, they do their engineering things and and yeah. a lot of whatever interest they so, have. So, so the key that you're saying then is that um if you want to apply that technical knowledge to the financial industry you've got to still have like in any other traditional role like in global markets as, as a normal standard trader you've just got to have that curiosity and interest in the subject matter itself as yeah, well as the technical sure i think if you like obviously if you're applying for software engineering i don't think you need it as much right because you're mm. you're mostly going to be in a back office um but these lucrative front office roles i'd say it's the skills are the same um the, which is why i think you know Without bragging, I think I, I I do pretty well in because I did the program with you guys went back when I wanted to do finance, right? Hmm. So I I took all the knowledge in and, and, and everything that we teach and, and kind of you know, I I, I guess I, I owe the pro if it wasn't for the the, the, the internship, I guess uh, I wouldn't know half the things I do and I wouldn't be able to do it. Um because I got in early, I guess, when I was eighteen and stuck in my head and but you had to carry on, right? Because, you know. Well look. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about what you've got cooking in the background then, because I know you've always got your fingers in a couple of pies. And I know you were, you were early on the whole crypto move. You were early on the whole busting out of a lot of the GameStop action when COVID hit. From a, from a just general market interest point of view, I don't know, NFTs or just any mm. algorithms you're working on. Is there anything at the moment that's floating your boat? uh nfts and, and crypto i've kind of left behind i think uh i think I, i've told you a few times i've, I've kind of i burnt myself out on on that and i think it was uh the the peaks kind of you know last year around march right it was when i, I had my nf i had my crypto hype back i was like i was on this I was like, <laughs> i'm gonna hold this for the next 10 years and then just suddenly out of nowhere one evening i think i, I told you right i was like i was just sitting here it was about 4 a.m in the morning i woke up and i was like i should sell my ethereum I don't know why, but I, I looked at the price and I was like, I've been watching this for a couple of days. It's, it's not moving. And then since I sold it, I haven't touched 
Yeah, yeah. You're, you so you're down. so you're the Ethereum <laughs> whale who got out at four thousand or whatever it was then that dropped the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's the thing. It's quite funny because I remember specifically. I just woke up randomly in the middle of the night and I was like, getting rid of this. It's <laughs> it's I my hype has just disappeared during my sleep. So um, have you actually run any models over the crypto data? And what has well, that what has that told you, if any information of? Um, I had a few algos. Um, but they were primarily technical, uh, and the reason being is I don't want to go into the fundamental side of algos because when it was fundamental analysis, I guess in terms of news, is I can't compete in speed. You know, like with oil release, for example. All right, cool. I could probably get the number uh, as fast as you can read it, but you know, there, there's so many people out there who, and, I, and this was one of the interesting things, I guess. I spoke to Citadel, one of the engineers, he said they don't care about the seconds between trades. They care about like the nanoseconds between trades. Mm. Um, and he, cause it, you know, to the point where he, obviously, yeah, you know, these, these firms have their exchanges in the same building as the actual exchange. Yeah. When they're executing these trades, they're like maybe across the, the corridor from them. Mm. Um, but in terms of, of myself with the models, I guess I, most of the strategies I've had kind of, uh, they used to work, I guess, up until this year um you know they, they looked good on paper uh but unfortunately i developed them this year so when i when i i let them out and and i was expecting them to do things they just they just failed and i think that's that's the hard part i think a lot of people forget is you know I, well i've been working on algos now for four years technically on and off but you know you, you need to to keep trying because and even when it does click it might work for a week and then you know markets change and uh, and then it'll stop working, even though hmm. you'd think, oh, it's it's the same strat, you know, I might be looking at something like, you know, w hmm. whatever you're doing. And, and I think that's the, the bit where you get frustrated, you get annoyed, you, you feel like, you know, what, I've wasted my time almost, you know, countless hours of, of coding. And then you're like, I'm just going to shelve it. So I have, like, on my, I have a folder that has a lot of code in it and different strategies over the years. And the problem is one of them might be working right now. <laughs> And I, and I don't know because there's so many, right? And, that, and that's why you have these. Now it, it clicks in my head why they have these massive teams because you need people to, to go back and, and look at these strats and say, okay, yeah. it, it used to work, but what's slightly changed? And obviously a, a one-man job on, on that is it's quite difficult. So ju ju just a kind of general question. And I'm not expecting like a definitive answer, but take like where we're at in the market at the moment where we got an inflation situation where it hasn't been this high in multiple decades. Now, from a data perspective, what would be interesting is to go back and look at kind of Fed rate um, behavior when inflation was last in, in modern history at these types of um, levels in order to then calculate what might the Fed do in the future. How do you, like from a data perspective, I can kind of see how that would make logical sense. But how do you start to then overlay in like the aspect of that was 1980. We're now in 2022. The market dynamic is incredibly different now in terms of you know, the, the dynamics of who's involved and how they're executing and managing these positional trades. So what would be your first kind of go-to then when you're looking to try and like, um, I guess, spec out that type of question? Yeah, I, I guess um, when when it comes to analyzing the future and things, um, obviously this is when you throw in machine learning and things right. like that. Um, and the reason being is machine learning, you know, it, it's a buzzword and it gets thrown around and literally everything has machine learning these days, right? Apparently. Um, but you want to take your data, like you're saying, and just basically just extrapolate it into thousands and, you know, hundreds and thousands of different outcomes. It's, it's kind of like, you know, um, when, when you... For example, in the movies, right? When when Doctor Strange does something and, and the <laughs> timeline goes into, you know, thousands right. of, of different runs or, or anything like that, it's, it's the same thing. You want to um, take this data and, and say, you know, predict, you know, a million possibilities that, that can happen. Uh, and then the, the thing is then, the hardest part, in, in my opinion, is then you have to rank them. And you have to, and that's, I guess, your, your, your secret sources, right? How do you look at these a million possibilities and say, this is the best one or, or, or you know, mm. this is the worst one, you know, I guess if you can crack that, that's how you'll, you'll, you'll make the money. And I haven't cracked that yet. <laughs> uh, in, in terms of being able to say like, obviously 
because the, the problem is right you might google it and you'll be like oh no there's a, there's an answer right there but it's on google it's it, that answer's not going to work right i guess it's like mm. like anything if you want to make a good algo even you need to it needs to be your own and and that will be your edge it's just like trading right you, every right. trader might have their own edge uh, the same thing applies here i guess is i can google it and i can tell you oh yeah well, let's apply this model onto it but if it's on google it, that's not going to be the one that that works and, and and there's a reason i guess it's publicly available i'm, I'm sure like citadel have have stuff that would rank things and yeah, you know, yeah. these models and and, and that, that's where the, the value is i guess so that, that that kind of again that terminology like machine learning or ai well i mean is this just fanciful to like to be talking about because I, I know what you mean like you get the sales team involved and all of a sudden your product has ai and machine learning like <laughs> potential but what's the reality of that in your eyes in terms of where we're at at the moment and then to where it's heading over a longer period are we like in the infancy part of it at the moment or is it more developed than that no i think we're still in the infancy like obviously uh, if you look at nvidia right um their graphics cards are just now putting the power i guess of being able to actually do like fast computations in the hands of your your average average joe right um you know as we progress and i've seen this you know they're focused less on gaming these days and, and performance and focus like you know our our graphics card can also do xyz in computational power um i think as time goes and and you know this computational power trickles down to, to, to your average joe um then i guess is 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 when kind of machine learning makes more sense like you know even with the iphones right like only the the new iphones have those you know they obviously they added that dedicated chip just for like machine learning and things like that in your phone um only now that because this stuff's happening i would say that machine learning makes more sense to put into a product but like you said they, they slap the title on literally everything and and sometimes the machine like machine learning is i'd say it's misunderstood because there's different ways and different levels like you can slap a label and i can have the smallest amount of machine learning which is which might just say you know ant likes coffee someone else likes coffee like that's a, a trend, um, yeah. you know, because that's all machine learning is, right? It's like, okay, five people like coffee now and they all live in one area. You know, there must be good coffee or something there. But like, that's not the machine learning you think of of in your head, right? And same with AI. I think at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, it's an oversimplification for all AI. But I, probably, I might get some slate for this, but it's just a bunch of conditional statements at the end of the day um, in terms of decision making, right? So... Hmm. I could make a robot and you could ask it like five questions. It'll make decisions. I can I say that that's an AI. It, you know, you, you asked it five different questions and it, it made a choice. Obviously then if you try and do other stuff, we'll say it's, it's not implemented yet. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, you, AI. you saying that then in that kind of more narrow structured way and uh, being a consumer of Netflix content. <laughs> <laughs> So, so then it, at this point, how do, how, how, I know this is a massive question, but how do you then start to counteract then the designer's influence on the instructions that create the underlying architecture of these, of these systems? I understand these systems can grow out and then design their own pathways, but the core architecture has to come from like a you, for example, and you will have some degree of biases no so how how, yeah, how do sure. people address where's that conversation at the moment because i know it's a big one um i think that's a that's a tricky one like uh even uh, yeah i don't know like if if i make an algo like you said i will have bias because i think one way is right and and obviously you, you might think an, another way is right um but that's why most of the time when when you see these people um making say ai that there are rules kind of in place you know not officially in place, but you know, like guidelines that kind of an ethical programmer would uh, would adhere to, and, and you know, uh, in terms of you know, you don't want to make an AI that just hates everyone. I mean, I've seen the AI that hates everyone, wasn't it on Twitter or something, yeah, right? The, the, the that, bot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, uh, like it, it's a very like it, it's a very hard question to answer. I guess it depends on it. I think like I'm, I'm just assuming, anyways. I'd assume that if you're a, a massive company and, and you're working on AI, you'd have a team because you'd want to make it as neutral as possible. You'd, and and that's unfortunately the thing. Like, you're basically just taking someone's brain, copying it, but making it unbiased. And that and that sounds mm. so hard to do because 
you know, even from an, from a trading perspective, I have to make an algo that I might flinch off to say hitting my stop loss. Like, uh, you know, let's say I hit five trades in a row on, on my stop loss. This algo needs to hit those five stops and keep going at the same rate it, it did the first trade, right? It needs to be unaware rather than I might be like, oh, if my algo hits five stop losses, I want it to now use a tighter spread. That's right. putting my bias into the program and then it yeah. might make the, the, the algo worse, essentially. Um, yeah. whereas I should be taking it as the algo has no emotion. Every trade is, should be the, the same trade, right? Regardless of the previous results. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I got to two things that I read recently. One was, um, just trying to recall the details, but it was Nomura put out a note about they were using AI for ESG scoring. And, and I get that because then that was, it was basically more about just these monumental data sets and it was generating certain pattern recognition that could then identify trends that a human would never be able to see. That then similar to the other example I had was when, I mean, when I started using Twitter for markets, I mean, this was a long time ago, over a decade ago, I guess. And back then it was like, not a well-recognized source of information as it is today. And there was lots of pop-up companies coming out and they'd have software aggregation tools that would then pick out on the hose pipe and alert then a team of analysts that would basically then add the human layer of, then, of the million tweets, the machines punching out 500 important ones, it deems, and then the human picks out the 10. Yeah, for sure. So there was always like, there's always the human element. There's almost like the pilot. It's almost like being in a super sophisticated aircraft where the plane can kind of fly itself, but the human still needs to sit in it to a certain extent because of the, you know, the what if scenario, or is this actually the right decision for the context and things like that. So yeah, I mean, that's how I've seen it develop in my career. And that's what I was still reading with the mirror as well the other day. Yeah, I, I think it's like you said that you hit the nail on the head there. It's it's exactly the same still. Like obviously, since they'll hire their investment and in, in trading people, and they do what you said. Like they'll they'll have the strat running, but you have that that individual you can rely on. And if if something you know goes haywire or it places the wrong trade, you need that you know the the, the pilot in this case, I guess, to 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 put things back to where it should be. Um, and I just had a quick look at, at this this Numura thing that you mentioned actually. Oh yeah. Um. I attempted this with Reddit back back during the, the, the <laughs> so go on, talk me through it then. Um, I tried. Well, there's other websites that already do this, but I was like, I want my own one that kind of does it for me. Um, and it would just scrape Reddit for every new post coming into Wall Street Bets, <laughs> and just say, well, "What's the ticker?" You know, analyze the sentiment because you know. So you have natural language processing, which is basically. You, know, you look at text and you compare it to a dictionary or you know a library a collection of words that will say the word bad is is negative you know if i said the stock is good that that's a, a positive sentence um so i'd look at a, a headline on reddit and it might say like you know everyone uses the dollar sign for example just to to, to make it easier so i'd say okay in this text look for the dollar what are the, the what's the ticker after the dollar it might be like dollar amd um then what what is the rest of the sentence and then from that I'd, I'd give it a score saying okay that was a very positive one um and then i'd add to a counter saying this was mentioned once in the last 24 hours mm. it run you know constantly all day reading these posts and and all i'd get at the end of the day still manually like you said right i'd log on to a i made a web web panel for it like an admin panel uh i'd log on and it'd say okay he's put, you know, this ticker was mentioned x amount of times this this is how many were positive this is how many were negative I can click on it and view all the all, all the different things, and the reason being is I guess back then I was like, okay, you know, who's these next? Little, yeah, yeah, who's next? What, what I want to know over the the next couple of days, right? There might be something that was mentioned maybe four times, and then you know, as it starts climbing and trending, and you're like, yeah, that's the the next one, and I, I hopefully hop on it early. Um, the problem I ran into, I guess, was like I said, it, as a as a one man job. Um, I didn't have the power to, 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 to run this thing and, and the data and, you know, leaving my computer on 24 seven, for example, just scraping data and analyzing it. Um, and then I think I had so much data. I just didn't know what to do with it myself because, you know, it becomes too yeah. much. And, and that's when, you know, like, uh, you know, big firms would have these different teams, I guess, where 
I need some I need someone who is a data scientist essentially and, and takes my data and says, Am I analyzing the correct way? Right. Because I obviously I did it from a very, very simple mm. um point of view. Um, but the, like I said, there are way more intense ways, I guess, of, of ranking things. And the problem I ran into was, and this is the one that I still bugs me today because I couldn't fix it, uh, was what happens if you don't put a dollar sign or you know when Wall Street bets kind of clocked that people were, were checking on the Reddit and running these algos, and they started using code. Like, um, for example, like instead of GME, right, they'd, they'd write something else. Um, mm. How do I get my algo to pick up these ones? Because it might say that GME was mentioned five times when actually it might be 500 because they're using their, their own code, right? Um, and then problems ran into, okay, well, if someone puts two spaces between the letters G and M and E, Right, so the permutations start building out and you need that's where you need that maintenance i guess that yeah and constant. that's where machine learning kind of you want your your algo to get smarter to say okay look someone's yeah. wrote gme with one space yesterday but now they're writing it with two that's it needs to correlate that to the same i was doing it manually i had a, a text file where i would add tickers yeah. um so if i saw something on reddit i'd be like okay people are typing it like this i'd add it to the text file and then my my, my program would start looking at it obviously that's not sustainable um so that's another one of my many shelved projects <laughs> i can say i've been there and i i tried it i guess okay well look just just, just to conclude things i guess a, a practical element of uh, you get told quite a lot rightly or wrongly if you're interested in finance particularly in markets and trading and this doesn't necessarily need to be quant this could even be just more standard investment bank sales trading that you need to know a programming language I think finance students now get told that just like vanilla, you should learn programming. Yeah. Now, A, is that true? And then B, if you're going to learn the language, which one? And then I guess C, how much do you need, actually need to know of that language? Okay, that's fair. Um, is it true? I, I think so. I think, well, so I, like you might learn your programming language and go into your job and you might not use it. Um, but I think what it prepares, you're preparing for a worst case scenario where let's say in six years, you know, we, we, we don't know what the landscape will be like, but if you already knew now how to code and, and maybe have you know, just, just all I ask of people is just have a basic understanding. So when you're talking to an engineer, you don't feel lost perhaps, you know, um, and, and what I kind of preach, I guess, to, to our interns, I guess, and, and just anyone I meet is, but learn a little bit and you never know at your job you might come up with an idea you know you don't have to code the idea just coming up with the idea could lead to to you revolutionizing a company right but if you didn't know how to think from a kind of what like if you don't know what can code do for you how will you come up with these ideas right you you want to like you said we're, we're always pushing forward i guess uh, as a um as a race um but you know, you need to, yeah, that, that, I guess that's my point is, you know, don't think, oh, the, Millen says, go learn to program. I never use programming for the next two or three years. I'm, I'm just preparing you and kind of giving you the opportunities to say, right, this is clicked. Cause you know, people come up to me all the time. Like I got an app. I'm like, yeah, because you don't have an understanding of how programming works. Your app is too ludicrous, I guess, for, for, for me to do anyways on my own or, you know, you're talking a couple million in, in terms of development for, for your, your, your little idea. Mm. Um, if you had a, a better understanding for programming, maybe you might come up with a different idea and things like that. So where do you um, actually start then? What, what's like the base language you'd recommend? So I start, so I, I think this surprises people. I actually started with Java, even though I don't use Java anymore. That was, I spent a whole maybe a year and a half at uni learning that. Um, and I did JavaScript and Python and C and, and everything. And I think when it comes to, to, to learning a programming language, I think I always recommend Python. It's not the fastest. It, it, the, the, you know, C, C is hands down, I guess, the, the, the better one for, for, for finance. But it's the easiest to get into, right? You download, you go to the, the Python website. I think it's like python.org. You download the thing. You open up a notepad. You write code and it just works. Like when it comes to Java and things, right? There, there's a lot more steps involved. You know, the last thing you want if for someone who wants to get into programming is to have issues installing the language and, and getting it running, right? You just want to, I just want to point people to this place and say, look, download this. You get this this little notepad window, write your code and and, and crack on. Um, 
Well, I say Python, but I think the the, the one thing uh, I always emphasize is regardless of what language you start, you just want to learn the fundamentals. So things like variables, data types, you know, data structures, um, you know, writing simple conditionals, for example, and then loops and things like that. Once you understand these concepts, when you go and pick up another language, all you need to learn is how to write it, right? I, I always say to people, it's the same as English UK and English uh, American, right? It's the same thing at the end of the day, but they, they, they say uh, aluminum and aluminium. Um, and but at the end of the day, like, you know, you can understand it. And my point is, if you learn Python, and um, I think going on to your question of how much, I guess, do you need to know? Um, I, t I always say to people about, I say 50 hours um, would probably make you very good not very good like you'd get a, a good understanding for, for programming so for example let's just say with will right i'd say when we started this whole uh quant shenanigans i guess uh, as a firm um will knew you know very minimal code and it would go, like kind of wouldn't be able to look at like maybe three or four lines and understand what's going on obviously he's been doing the sims with me and and i i remember once when we were meant to go to these states but obviously we, we got denied um we went to have lunch and I sat down with Will and maybe spent about two, two or three hours of me just reading line by line each thing in our quant program and explaining to him, how does this work and, and things like that. And then kind of Will's understanding, I guess, is uh, improved and to the point where he was even saying to me, he could run the sim almost, even though he's, you know, he's not an engineer, obviously. Um, he, he doesn't even code for a living, right? He doesn't do it every day, but, you know, repetition. And I, I would probably say I've spent maybe... 20 to 30 hours with him just looking at the code has got to the point where with, with our quants in many ways that will almost sometimes answers the questions without even coming to me but when we ran it initially it'd be to the point where will would have his hand up every five seconds being like "Millen, can you come here <laughs> so i think in, in terms of learning i'd say go for python just for the, the ease of getting into things um and then about 50 hours i'd say but so, so 50 hours i'm just thinking about the maths there so you're you're I know we're coming to the back end of summer, but you could do it as a summer project, right? Yeah. So I think um, uh, the easiest way to learn programming is don't, okay, so go do your, your code academies, you know, your, your different courses online. Don't pay for anything ever uh, in, in terms of like, you know, 15, 20 quid to, to learn Python because you can Google how to learn Python, right? It, it, you know, engineers have helped each other out. You know, all the resources are online. Mm. Um, but basically, pick a topic that you want to do. Don't just go in with the idea of I'm going to learn programming and then follow the, the, the course. I'd say, say, okay, I want to build, let's just say a, a very simple uh, text analysis bot, right? You give it a sentence and it'll tell you if it was bad or good. That sounds horrendous and, and really hard, I guess, from, 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 say, for example, you were to do it, Anne, right? It, it probably sounds really difficult. Um, but then break that down, right? Okay, I need to get my Python code to read text. That's now one like subtask on its own, right? Um, okay, I want to read the text from a text file. Okay, then that's another subtask. And all I would say is just do that little bit by bit, you know, like Lego, you're going to start with one little little piece and, and just start building it up. And the next thing you know, you'll, you'll have your, your, your Lego Bugatti or something uh, <laughs> uh, made. Um, but like start with that and then you Google, okay, how do I read a text file in Python? Mm. like you know the internet's amazing everything's there um and you start from that and the next thing you know is you've done that then the next task right now how do i how do i score this text how do i determine if this text is bad or good then you go down a rabbit hole of that and then you'll you know i think that's the best way to program because you're not doing it for the sake of like i'm, I'm sitting down to, to learn something right I'm, I'm doing this because i want to achieve something but at the same time i'm going to learn from scratch um, and I think that's the, the biggest difference, I think, between myself and, and many programmers is I spend a lot of time outside of work, I guess, just writing random stuff, right? And like I said, I've got hundreds of scrapped projects and just shelved, but I learned something doing all of them. And, and, and that's what kind of builds you up into to, to being a, a good programmer almost. And, and it's just like finance. I'm sure you can agree, like you've probably spent countless hours, I guess, um, just researching and reading for your own enjoyment as well at the end of the day. Yeah, much as my wife hates that. <laughs> <laughs>
But look, look, we'll wrap it up there. Um, Milan, thanks very much for giving up some time and sharing some of your insights and thoughts. What I will do is I will put your LinkedIn profile, if you don't mind, into the show notes on the podcast. So if anyone wants to reach out to Milan, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't mind helping. No, no, that's fine. I, I've, uh, I always tell anyone, if, if you ever need anything, uh, message me. I, get, I think I had someone from about two years ago I met and, and she sent me a... Uh, uh, an algo she did for for a dissertation or something and i was like okay well i had wow. a read of it and, and i gave some feedback um but like i said my my inbox is always open if i don't reply don't take it personally it's just quite busy uh <laughs> but, but eventually i i normally tend to try and get get back to people uh or you can always yeah message me on instagram if, if, you, if, if you're really really desperate <laughs> cool all right we'll wrap it up there uh thanks everyone for listening and we'll be back as normal next week. All right, have a good weekend, everyone.